gusto que nos estés acompañando en nuestro lobby virtual. Es una gran bendición que estés con nosotros. Y bueno, pues el día de hoy es un día súper especial. Hoy es el Día del Padre y estamos muy contentos que nos estés acompañando. Y bueno, no queríamos que el Día del Padre se pasara como un día más. Sabemos que es una gran bendición contar con nuestros papás, esa figura hermosa, fuerte, cariñosa que tenemos a nuestro lado. Y bueno, pues como te decía, no queremos que pase un, como un domingo más, así que invitamos a algunos papás de nuestra familia de Substance Alcanza Monterrey a participar en un juego con nosotros. Si bien sabes, pues siempre los papás eh, son un poco, ¿cómo lo diré? Un poco distraídos. Y bueno, tienen muchas virtudes, pero una de las cosas muy peculiares de los papás es que son un poco distraídos y bueno, eso a las mamás nos puede súper encantar porque nos da la oportunidad de tener unas grandes anécdotas con ellos y nuestros hijos. Así que el día de hoy, pues invitamos a los papás a que nos acompañaran a escuchar una serie de preguntas de algunas ocurrencias que ellos han tenido con sus hijos y ellos van a tener que adivinar quién pa cuál papá fue capaz de hacer semejante travesura o semejante idea con ellos así que bueno vamos a leer las preguntas y ellos van a tener que adivinar quién creen que hizo esto ok está bien bueno vamos con la primera pregunta y la primera pregunta dice así un día mi hija se enfermó del estómago y haciendo fila para comprar unas donas me di cuenta que habíamos dejado un pequeño camino de rastros por ahí quién crees que fue Ok, segunda pregunta. Yo como papá me equivoqué de guardería y dejé a mi hija en una guardería en la cual ella ya no estaba inscrita. Seguimos. Estaba tan emocionado por ser papá, otra vez, que grabé a mi esposa en plenas contracciones rumbo al hospital. A mis hijos, para que sigue, a mis hijos les encanta que les prepare torrejas. ¿Quién crees que es? ¿A qué sigue? Jugando a la alberca con mi hija, me quedé dormido dentro de ella. La que sigue, cuando llevo a mis hijas al baño, la sacudo en lugar de limpiarlas. Soy experto en enseñarles matemáticas a mis hijos. Siguiente. En una ocasión, mi hija no paraba de llorar, así que decidí meterme a su cuna y dormirme junto con ella. Mi especialidad es hacerles espagueti con carne molida. Yo como papá solo sabía combinar a los niños y nunca a las niñas. ¿A qué sigue? Soy un super papá porque soy capaz de de tomarme el café que prepara mi hija sin importar cuántas cucharadas de azúcar le pone o cuántas cucharadas de café le pone a mi taza. Mis hijas me aman tanto que son capaces de comerse unos hot cakes tostaditos. La que sigue. Tengo una exclusividad en preparar unos ricos huevitos con cualquier cosa que se me ocurra. ¿Para qué sigue? Dejo que mis hijas me pinten las uñas. Y la última. Esta cuarentena me ha tenido que exigir lo doble de trabajo como papá, pero lo he hecho muy bien. ¿Qué tal? ¿Se sorprendieron con la respuesta? ¿Ustedes allá pudieron adivinar qué papás son los que 
fueron los protagonistas de estas historias. Y bueno, nuestra intención es divertirnos. Sabemos que los papás son unas personas geniales que día a día divierten a sus hijos y nos la pasamos muy bien con ellos. Si tú tienes una anécdota así chistosa, te invitamos a que aquí en los comentarios nos la compartas y bueno, reámonos juntos de esta gran labor que haces con papá. Y queremos decirte que agradecemos a Dios por tu vida y estoy seguro que tus hijos, estas ocurrencias, estas vivencias nunca se les va a olvidar. Así que, bueno, te invitamos a que este día del padre en casa lo disfrutes, aproveches este tiempo en casa que jamás lo habíamos podido tener. Dios te bendiga y te invitamos a que sigas disfrutando nuestra transmisión. Hasta luego. Hola familia, bienvenido a Substance Alcance Monterrey. Qué bueno que estás con nosotros en nuestra reunión en línea. Y hoy es un día muy especial porque estamos celebrando a todos los papás. Feliz Día del Padre. Qué bueno que estés aquí y si tú eres un papá, felicidades, que espero que te la pases súper bien, que tu familia te consienta el día de hoy. Si algo que reconocemos, sobre todo en la iglesia, es reconocer a nuestro Dios también como un Padre celestial. Porque sabemos que en nuestras vidas muchos de nosotros podemos tener a una mamá al lado de nosotros, pero son tan pocos los que han crecido con un papá junto con ellos. Por eso nuestro Dios se refleja como el padre del huérfano y el esposo de la viuda. Y el día de hoy, pues tenemos algo especial, alguna sorpresa preparada para ti, un pequeño video que queremos iniciar antes de comenzar nuestro espacio de alabanza. Así que prepárate donde tú estás para comenzar esta reunión en línea.
Gracias Señor porque Nos permitiste el día de hoy De ver la luz de un nuevo día Señor Y nos permites levantarnos con bien Señor En esta hora Señor te queremos dar gracias Señor Porque has sido bueno con nosotros Y jamás nos has abandonado Señor Te queremos entregar este tiempo de adoración a ti Señor Porque te lo mereces Señor Porque has sido bueno con nosotros Gracias Padre So 
las murallas se caen, toda ansiedad se va, todo dolor se va, toda enfermedad está echada afuera por su poder en su nombre. Con su poder se rompen cadenas, cantará el cielo y la tierra. Santo eres Jesús, Santo Dios te bendiga, sin duda hemos tenido un excelente tiempo con el grupo de alabanza y en este momento quiero invitarte a que sigamos alabando a Dios, no solamente con nuestra boca, con nuestra voz, sino quiero que también lo hagamos con nuestros diezmos y nuestra ofrenda. En nuestra iglesia Substance Monterrey siempre tenemos, hemos aprendido algo de cultura, de generosidad y sabes, a Dios le gusta que le demos siempre lo primero y lo mejor, como lo dice en la Biblia. Y quiero que leer algo para ti que está en 2 de Corintios capítulo 9, versículo 7. Y dice de la siguiente manera. Cada uno debe decidir en su corazón cuánto dar. Y no den de mala gana ni bajo presión. Porque Dios ama a la persona que da con alegría. Sabes, cuando a mí me dan algo que me viene alguien y me regala, no sé, ropa o dinero, me gusta que lo hagan de una buena manera, me gusta que lo den con una sonrisa en su, en su cara, pero sobre todo también en su corazón. Y de igual manera, a Dios le gusta que le des con alegría todo lo que tú le quieras dar. Y sabes, nuestros diezmos y nuestra ofrenda se usan para que este auditorio esté funcionando, para ayudar a familias en esta temporada difícil y también para que otras iglesias se abran alrededor del mundo junto con nuestra asociación ARC. Y pues hay dos maneras de dar. La primera es entra a la página web de nuestra iglesia en la sección de donativos de una manera muy rápida y sencilla. Y la segunda es a través de una transferencia electrónica con nuestra clave interbancaria. Te pido que me ayudes a orar en este tiempo por estos diezmos y estas ofrendas. Dios, gracias te damos porque tú eres bueno, porque siempre estás supliendo todas y cada una de nuestras necesidades. Sabemos que tú nos das más de lo que necesitamos y más de lo que merecemos. Queremos que bendigas a cada una de las personas que ha podido dar con generosidad en este día y que seas tú supliendo para su familia y en su trabajo. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén. Bueno familia, gracias por compartir y dar de tu con generosidad. Dios te bendiga.
Qué bueno que continúas con nosotros. Espero que este tiempo de alabanza haya sido de gran bendición para tu vida. El día de hoy quiero darte la bienvenida una vez más a nuestra reunión en línea. Y hoy tenemos algo especial para toda la familia de Substance. El día de hoy va a estar compartiendo nuestro pastor global, Pastor Peter Haas, va a estar con nosotros. Y el día de hoy va a traer una palabra especial dentro de esta reunión para nuestras vidas. Espero que estés listo donde tú estás. Quita toda distracción, quita toda cosa que esté a tu alrededor para que podamos enfocarnos en el mensaje y la palabra que Dios tiene preparada para nosotros. Vamos a escuchar. What is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. You made it to church. Woo! Man, I miss you guys. We are family. I got all my sisters with me. You know, with, with us coming back to do physical church again, it is so much fun. Fun, man. I just, I see all of you guys and I just, I miss so many of you, others of you, not so much. No, but seriously, I miss all of you guys. Uh, and today is extra fun because I, our Mexico campus is also watching this too. I miss you guys. So ah, bad idea. Okay, so I probably still need to be wearing my neck brace a little bit more. I can actually take it off about half the time, and if you missed it, I, I got into a bike accident, got a spinal injury, and ugh. But the good news, you guys, the good news is this. I'm only about a week away from taking it off, ah, which is so good because, man, it this is so hot. I'm starting to get a weird tan line. Actually, you know what? I think I'm good for today. These, these lights are so hot. Okay, so today though, we're gonna have so much fun. We're actually gonna study a Bible passage out of Joshua chapter five. And if you were at our, our prayer meetings this last Wednesday, I actually shared a part one to this message. And if you missed that, it's gonna be online. Uh, but listen, I'm going to share this in a way uh, from the very beginning. I'm gonna recap the story so that if you missed it, you're still gonna be able to fully understand where we're going today. And if you've never read Joshua chapter five before. This story takes place before the famous battle of Jericho. Okay, remember Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Remember that? Okay, yeah. Uh, you see, Joshua was the leader of God's people. And of course, you know, he knew they're about to go into war. They're about to enter the promised land and they were the underdogs and they're attacking the big dog city. I mean, this is the, the impossible city with technological advantages. They had no idea idea how to do this, okay? And, and so this is the setup, okay? This is where they were. And, and then all of a sudden, one day, this, this divine figure appeared in front of Joshua with a sword, okay? How intimidating. Uh, the commander of the Lord's army. He announced himself, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. And, and of course, some people, scholars argue, you know, some people think it was an angel of the Lord appearing with a big sword. Other people argue that it was a prefigurement, a theophany of Christ himself. Um, because all of a sudden he starts talking like God in the first person. But uh, the, the point is a divine figure appeared in front of Joshua and he was completely startled when this guy appeared. And, and in fear, he asked a simple question and this was it. Are you for us or are you for them? Are you for us or are you for them? The people of Jericho, this, this warrior, are you gonna fight for us? Are you gonna, and, and again, us versus them. Joshua was startled and he comes out with a classic question, us versus them. Now, I think us versus them has been kind of a big deal throughout history when you think about it. It's kind of been a big problem for mankind since the very beginning, right? In election years, it's all about us versus them. In war, it's always about us versus them. The media is divided with us versus them narratives, right? And think about like workplace betrayals. It always turns into you have to choose sides. You're either for us or for them, right? Or like a lot of times in divorces, when they get messy. A lot of times they have to divide up their friends. You're either with me or you're with them. It's really a way that you and I oftentimes decide who is moral, who is not. Who is safe, 
who is not, okay? And, and really, it's a part of sin entering into the world, us versus them. Whenever there's a crisis, whenever people feel insecure, it always results in people needing affirmation. Are you with us or are you with them? And Joshua, he's in one of those situations. He knows he's about to go into war. He's, he's nervous, those types of things. And so, um, you know, he sees this scary divine figure holding a sword that just appears in front of him. He needed affirmation, right? Are you with us? or are you with them? In some ways, what's kind of funny is because this commander was the commander of the Lord's armies, and Joshua is the leader of God's chosen people, you would have thought the commander would have just said, well, come on, duh, Joshua, of course, I'm the commander of the Lord's armies, you're God's people, so duh, I'm with you. And yet, what's so fascinating about this passage and in this story is the commander of the Lord's army goes out of his way to avoid us versus them. And check this out, Joshua 5.14, listen to what this divine figure says. Neither, he replied, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Okay, it's kind of a unique thing to say to Joshua in this moment, because you, you have to understand, this is not what Joshua wants to hear. This is not reassuring him. But really what he's saying is, Joshua, is I'm not gonna choose us versus them. There's only one agenda, one righteous entity in the world, and that's God, right? God doesn't pick sides. He is the side and you're either choosing him or you're in the same position as as your enemy right in other words don't you dare try to make me subservient to your insecurity your need for an us versus them and what did joshua do next so profound verse 14 then joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him what message does my Lord have for his servant? He realized that he said the wrong thing and he needed to get his, uh, his heart straight. Re I mean, instant repentance, right? Verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so, okay? And get this, from that moment on, that's when God actually shared the divine strategy for how Joshua and God's people were gonna face Jericho. And that's where the big miracle, the famous story of marching around Jericho occurred. And it ended up being one of the most talked about stories in the entire Bible. Now, I wanna ask the question, I wanna meditate on this question, why did God say neither? Neither us nor them. Well, for starters, uh, this is kind of an interesting point. God knew that one of the citizens of Jericho would actually become the lineage, would actually become one of the ancestors for the Messiah. In other words, think about it. Joshua, the very people you've been demonizing for the last 40 years, the very people you've been talking about going to war with for the last 40 years, I'm actually gonna use one of those people, Rahab, who's actually a prostitute of all people. This is gonna become the great grandmother of one of your most famous kings, King David. And eventually, not only is Rahab going to be used to give birth to King David, but Rahab, this, this city, this person from Jericho, your enemy, is literally going to give birth to the Savior of all mankind. I mean, that's what God knew that Joshua didn't know. And so I believe that God actually said neither because he didn't want Joshua thinking in us versus them. God didn't want that because God was looking at people like Rahab with a redemptive lens. And I believe that God calls us to not choose sides. Don't get me wrong, you can get involved in politics, but being involved in politics does not mean you have to be partisan. That means to suspend your ultimate allegiance to God for the sake of some earthly carnal strategy, okay? To be political is fine, that means to be ethical. But, but ultimately, God's like, hey, I want you to see everyone through a redemptive lens. And instead of antagonizing people, I want you to, to drop this us versus them language so that all of a sudden you're actually influencing. You can't antagonize and influence people at the same time, right? Kindness leads people to repentance, the Bible says, Romans 2, 4. And so in a similar way, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I just want to ask you a question. And I, I think this does really strike at the heart of a lot of racist tendencies or prejudice at its very root form. What if today, what if today the very person who irritates you most 
What if God had a plan to turn them into your best friend, into the person who helps you most, blesses you most? What if, the, what if some of those people that irritate you the most, some of you, you have a political person come to mind, a news pundit come to mind, I don't know who, come, a coworker. What if God had a plan to turn them into the greatest preacher ever in your generation? And what if God wanted to activate that plan using you? Listen, if you cannot see the world through the eyes of redemption, then you're gonna miss out being used by God for some of the greatest moments in history. What if if we were unnecessarily antagonizing the very person God wanted us to influence most just because we needed to cathartically vent something on Facebook? Okay, listen. God wants us to steward our influence, and that's ultimately why I believe the only thing that we really should be doing right now is falling on our faces, taking off our shoes, so to speak, and treating God as the only holy entity in all of the universe, because that's when the plan of God gets released, church. You know, recently with all the racial tension in Minneapolis, I think us versus them narratives have just been everywhere on social media. And I I just, you know, uh, the other day I was just really disturbed by what I was seeing on both sides of the political aisle. And and I remember like in that moment, all of a sudden this this thought came to me. A a year ago, I heard a prophecy about Minneapolis that I, I just wanted to share with you because I think it kind of puts things in perspective in a very unique way. Now, uh, many of you guys know that I still believe that God is speaking prophetically. I don't believe that the prophetic overrides scripture. I think you judge the prophetic with scripture, okay? But I I do believe in the prophetic words of God. In fact, actually our entire downtown campus is a prophetic miracle, okay? So I I know that most of you guys believe in the prophetic as well. Well, uh, about a year ago, I got to hear a, a Christian leader by the name of Sean Bowles who he happened to be visiting Minneapolis from Los Angeles. And of course, if you don't know who Sean uh, Bowles is, he's the, he's the preacher who became famous for prophesying that, that, that Kanye West was gonna get saved and God was gonna turn him into a worship leader. And of course, I remember at the time when, when he proclaimed that, everybody was like, no stinking way. This is Kanye. This is the guy who just declared himself to be a God, okay? There's no way that's true. And then of course, boom, it happened. And next thing you know, Substance did a Kanye song for Christmas. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm just, okay, so this is that same guy who prophesied that about Kanye, right? Well, he was visiting Minneapolis, I believe it was March of 2019, and he publicly prophesied in front of hundreds of people that God was about to do something big in Minneapolis for racial issues. And I remember hearing this and he said, actually, something is about to happen in Minneapolis that the whole world is gonna come to Minneapolis to learn about race and that God was gonna birth a healthy civil rights movement out of what God was doing that would affect the entire world, okay? And and I quote, this is actually uh, specifically, this. I was paraphrasing that, but he actually said this. He said, and people are going to look at Minnesota programs as a pilot way to do racial reconciliation, that, that, that he's been putting people in the right places at the right time. And people will say about Minnesota, your numbers statistically on racial equality and gender equality are unbelievable in the nation and that God was actually going to bring this about. You know, I, I wanted to share that because I, I know that uh, if you've really just watched the news at all. I'm the first person to say, I know that there's a lot of pain on this issue. I know that there are a lot of extreme voices. And I think that there's a lot of you out there who you you listen to this and then all of a sudden it puts you into that posture of Joshua. Well, are you for us or are you for them? And listen, God always gets the final word. I don't care how many crazy voices there are in this city. There's only one voice who gets the last word and that's the voice of our God. The Bible says, Psalm 46, he speaks and the earth melts. Man, the only thing we need to be surrendering and bowing down to, the only thing we need to fear is the fear of the Lord, okay? And and I just, I know that there's a lot of um, people with this us versus them narrative, and I just want to encourage you as the church of God, Let's pull ourselves back from some of the partisan narratives, the us versus them narratives, the crazy talk. People are insecure and I get it. And part of that is just crisis 
fatigue. People have so much cortisol, stress hormone built up in their lives. They're just, they're not even thinking straight. And, and, and part of it is they don't even, non-Christians, they don't know how to fall on their face in surrender like Joshua, okay? But guess what? We do. We know how to do this kind of stuff. And when we do, I believe that that's when God is going to give His church, His people, the game plan that's going to result in the fulfillment of prophecies like this. But you know what? We, in order to get there, we've got to stop and do what Joshua did. Stop the us versus them narrative and get on our faces and start asking God, what is your plan for me to be the solution? And I think that some of us, there, there's gonna be common sense ways that we can just show people value. And honestly, that's what people need most. Everyone everywhere ultimately is just crying out for value. It's insecurity resulting in us versus them. But you and I have the ability to, to, to actually stop that at the root by showing them the love of God. God loves you. And until people experience the love of the God who created the universe, nothing is ever going to be peaceful. You realize that, right? You see, and, and just to explain this switch, I, I just want to, I want to end with a story that I think a lot of you guys are going to be able to relate to. Back in the 1700s, uh, there was a young woman by the name of Maria. And of course, she dreamed that someday she might be able to participate in high society. There was very much sexism and classism in the 1700s. And she was born a commoner. She was a daughter of a cook. And of course, uh, even more than that, she was born a woman. And she realized that her dream of climbing the social ladder was really far-fetched, slim and none, because she knew what her lot in life was. And I suppose in some ways, I think, um, you know, Maria was, was no different than any of us. She started out with really huge dreams. She, and, and like, you know how it is. We're all, we all have dreams, but sometimes dreams, they turn into delays. And sometimes those delays, they turn into devastation. And many of us, when we have those moments of devastation, we just, we lose hope. And that's exactly what started to happen to Maria in those days. As soon after she got married, her young husband died tragically. And so already by age 18, she's a widow and a single mom, which in those days was like a death sentence for people vocationally. After all, who's gonna marry her, let alone hire her, right? And, and so soon after that, um, you know, she's a single mom and her little boy ended up tragically dying too. And so now she's, she's barely 20, 20 years old and she's already experienced a lifetime of sorrow. Shortly after that, things seemed to be turning around. She, she eventually did get remarried. She married this young musician who actually came from an upper-class family, but once again, her life started sliding in the wrong direction. After, get this, she had eight children with this man, and of the eight, five of those children ended up dying tragically. And obviously back in the 1700s, there wasn't much medical care. Um, and it was common for, for at least one out of four kids to die um, before they reached 18. But even in those days, to lose five kids, I mean, even in those days, that would have been considered extra tragic. And then to make matters worse, the family of her husband, this upper-class family who was already mad that their son married this lower-class girl, um, they weren't helping at all. In fact, actually, uh, it was unheard of in those days to marry outside of your social class, and the family never approved of it. And so when all these tragedies started happening, um, the family's disdain, they're, 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 they're really, their racism, sexism turned into outright rejection for her. And they were like, listen, you know what? You know what the real reason is? You shouldn't have ever married Maria. We told you. We told you that this girl was bad luck. We told you this girl was bad news. That's what happens when you marry a lower class woman. And of course, their son, you know, just to even cope with all this persecution from his own family, he started um, turning to alcohol. He became an alcoholic. He pretty much came home every single night in a drunken stupor uh, to abuse his family. And the, the abuse escalated to the point where he eventually, he beat and he raped his own wife, Maria. And in the lowest moment of her life, she discovered that once again, she's pregnant because of this rape. And now, now where does she go? Now, what is she supposed to do now? I mean, she wants to run from this abusive man, but 
I mean, how is she, she can't work. She, she, I mean, she's literally in an impossible situation. And, and I think maybe you're out there today and your life isn't maybe that bad, but you've got things going on and it's just, it's heavy on you. You just, you, you, in those moments, you're like, God, where are you? Where are you in this? I don't know about you, but I've asked that question numerous times over the last couple of months. God, why this? Why this crisis? Why another crisis? Why now? And in the midst of her depression, she finally concluded, you know what? I'd just be better off getting an abortion. Um, you know what? Even better, I would be better off just killing myself. And so she made the decision tragically to, uh, to, to figure out how to do this. She, she scraped together whatever money she had. She bought an expensive bottle of deadly poison and she poured the entire bottle into a cup of tea, which she planned to drink. And she poured it into this tea and her hands were trembling so much over what she was about to do that as she reached for the cup, she just, she accidentally knocked the cup off the table and it broke, spilled the poison all over the floor. And, and of course, it just sent her straight into hysterics. I mean, she started weeping and crying. I mean, cause she's thinking, I can't even afford more poison. Like I'm such a failure. I can't even succeed at killing myself. And in the midst of that moment of just hysterics, she just stopped and she started praying to God and, and she was like, God, where are you? And, and the moment she even said that phrase, all of a sudden, she just sensed the presence of God all over her. And she just felt the Holy Spirit just impress upon her heart, Maria, what are you doing? Why are you quitting on me? I'm not quitting on you. Why are you quitting on me? In fact, I'm not even remotely done with your life. Maria, I've got a plan, and if you would just walk with me, I will unveil that plan to you. And somehow in that moment, this impression felt so real, felt so strong. She just knew I didn't knock that cup off the table by accident. In fact, maybe God does have a plan for me, and maybe God does have a plan for this baby. And so despite the pain, she ended up just moving forward, and, and, and she eventually gave birth to a little baby boy, and quite frankly, we should be glad that she gave birth to that little boy because that little boy's name was Ludwig von Beethoven, who went on to become one of the greatest composers of all time. All time. Maria, Beethoven's mom, ended up being blessed beyond her wildest imagination. In fact, Maria ended up traveling the world with her son. She met some of the most exquisite people on planet Earth. And even though all the odds were against her, she ended up being able to transcend some of the constraints of her time. God took her to places she never even dreamed were possible. But you know what? Where did it start? Where did it start, people? It started the same place it started with Joshua, where she got on her knees and surrendered to God. It started the same place where Maria got on her knees and surrendered to God. And I, I think what's really extra interesting about Beethoven is Beethoven ended up having to make the same decision. He had struggles of his own, much like his mom. All sorts of things started going wrong in his life. And right as his fame as a, as a music performer was taking off, he started losing his hearing. I mean, the worst thing you could lose for a, for a, for a composer and music performer and yet, get this, despite going completely deaf, he still kept writing some of his greatest concertos. Think about that. And when people would tell him, Beethoven, you're crazy. It's time to hang it up. He said, you know what? God is with me. Come on. God is with me. I know he's close to me when I do my art, he said. And so I'm going to keep walking fearlessly with him. That's what he did to church. In fact, get this, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, one of his most famous, was written after he had become completely deaf. And one of the songs from that symphony ended up becoming one of the most famous hymns in all of church history. You might remember it, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. It's Beethoven's music put to Henry Van Dyke's poetry. And just, just to jog your memory, I've asked a few of Substance staff, Max and Zoe from our worship team, just to come and sing a short little verse or two of it. And so as they sing this, just let 
the, the lyrics really sink in. Because, And then I'm going to end with one last thought. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt que ya has escuchado este mensaje espero que haya sido de gran bendición para tu vida el pastor Peter hablaba acerca de esta historia de Beethoven al final y cómo Dios en medio de la tragedia vino a traer lo mejor dentro de ese tiempo en el cual muchos pensaban sobre todo la mamá de Beethoven que era una de las peores temporadas dentro de su vida a punto de rendirse a punto de ella misma de quitarse la vida pero ve lo que Dios hace en medio del dolor. Y tal vez dentro de esta cuarentena tú estás pasando por esa jornada. Tal vez en medio de esta cuarentena Dios ha hablado durante este mensaje a tu vida y ese, este mensaje era para ti. O tal vez conoces específicamente a aquella persona que necesita escuchar. No sé dónde tú te encuentres, pero tal vez el día de hoy sea el momento de empezar la jornada junto con Jesús. Y comienza con solo hacer una pequeña oración. Comienza con decirle a, a Jesús que entra a tu vida y entra a tu corazón. ¿Por qué no cierras tus ojos por un instante? Y si tú nunca has hecho esta oración, si tú tal vez nunca has tenido la oportunidad de reafirmar tus votos, el día de hoy, ¿por qué no comenzamos simplemente con repetir esta pequeña oración? Señor Jesús, te pido que entres a mi vida, entres a mi corazón. Te acepto como mi Señor y mi Salvador. Gracias por morir por mí. Acepto que no tengo el control de todo, pero reconozco que tú tienes el control de mi vida, desde ahora y para siempre. En el nombre de Jesús. Amén. Si esa fue tu oración el día de hoy, nos encantaría comenzar la jornada junto contigo. ¿Por qué no nos mandas un pequeño mensaje al 811-221-0080? 811-221-0080. Con la palabra acepté a Jesús. Para nosotros comenzar la jornada junto contigo y darte los siguientes pasos. Y antes de terminar, ¿por qué no cerramos con un espacio de alabanza y adoración con nuestro equipo de alabanza? Y cantamos juntos y donde tú estés, en tu sala, tal vez en tu habitación o en tu carro, donde tú te encuentres el día de hoy. ¿Por qué no entregamos este espacio cantando juntos? Vamos a cantar. cesarán al sonar de tu voz tú, que calmas tempestad y todo mi interior con tu poder lo harás Cristo, Cristo la oscuridad Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Hey, qué bueno que te pudiste conectar con nosotros. Nos dio mucho gusto verte conectado. Esperemos que este mensaje y esta alabanza hayan sido bendición para tu vida. Y te queremos decir algo, que si tú aceptaste a Cristo en tu corazón, puedes mandar un mensaje a este teléfono que está apareciendo en pantalla, que es Acepté a Jesús y nuestro pastor o líderes de la iglesia se van a poner en contacto contigo. Y otra cosa es decirte que nos vemos el otro domingo a las 11 y 1 de la tarde. Te esperamos. Back from